welcome everybody from all around the world. And we've been talking about the different time zones we are in. The sun's just starting to come up on a cloudy day in Vancouver. Um, thanks for taking time over everybody's different holidays to take part in this ceremony, which uh, we, it's uh, IARJ Hall of Fame Awards. We had the first ones last year um, in Utah on a real place. Um, this is where we actually got to meet people in person. But um, just really briefly for people who aren't too familiar with the IARJ, we were founded in Bellagio, Italy in 2012. Um, we have more than 500 members around the world. Um, we've organized more than eight conferences on five continents. And they've been amazingly fascinating for me, Canadian. So and this is the second years for the awards. Um, we were in Salt Lake City, organized at a great conference organized by Peggy Stack for it last year. And we gave awards to um, Maria Paz Lopez, who's here with us. Um, she has done many things in journalism, working for La Vanguardia. She covered the Vatican for a long time and then is now the German correspondent for the paper. La Vanguardia is in Barcelona, great paper. We also gave a Lifetime Achievement Award to the late Anthony Shadid. He's an American with Lebanese roots. Uh, he covered the Middle East for Associated Press and other publications. He won two Pulitzer Prizes for international reporting. And he was shot on assignment in Ramallah at one point. He was reported missing in Libya at another point. He was a staunch believer in reconciliation of religions. Um, but he died in 2012 of an asthma attack when he was on assignment in, um, in Syria. But this year we have two equally well, quite incredible journalists with incredible careers. And that's David Briggs and Eric Cabendera. I could talk a lot about David, especially about Eric too, um, from what I know about him. And, but we've got other people to talk about their fascinating and like powerful career, so let that start. Um, just the, the format is that we, uh, the speaker speak for five minutes um, and we'll try to wrap this up in an, an hour and 10 minutes. Um, and then Eric, uh, Andy wants to get a photo of us at the end, so don't sign off too quickly at the end. And Eric's, uh, Andy's got an idea for us getting a photograph of us all. So, and we're going to start with a presentation to David, my old buddy, um, and with an introduction about David by Andy Bayuni. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doug. Well, it gives me a, a great pleasure in introducing the first of two recipients of the IRJ Hall of Fame Awards uh, tonight, uh, today. Uh, David Briggs uh, Sr. I have to add Sr. because his son is also called David and a journalist too, and is here with us. Uh, David Briggs Sr. towers in the journalism profession. Yes, he's super tall, that he should be playing basketball instead of writing about religion, but I think we, he made the right career choice. <laughs> his achievements in journalism makes him stand out above the rest. Yet in spite of this, and in spite of his, his height, He's super, super humble. David Briggs Sr. is the brain behind the International Association of Religion Journalists, IARJ. It has been his longtime dream to set up an international group like this. And he made it happen in 2012 when he assembled 20, 23 journalists from around the world in Bellagio, a beautiful town in Northern Italy located between two lakes, where we launched the IARJ. I was one of those fortunate 23 journalists that he had picked up, he had picked for the gathering. That's when I got to know David, and I recall how passionately he urged us all to set up this association. David served as executive director of the IRJ for four years, and I had the fortune or misfortune to succeed. <laughs> it's certainly an honor to have been asked to continue his fine work but I can tell you that he had left too big a shoe to fill in. And he, kind, he kindly agreed to stay as special advisor to help. David is currently writing and editing the Ahead of the Trend columns 
for the blog of the Association of Religion Data Archives. The founding director, Roger Finke, is with us. He will have something to say about this later. For a long time, David was the national religion writer for the Associated Press, starting in 1994. During his time with AP, he was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize at least eight times. He had joined AP in 1988 as a reporter for religion and ethics. And he began his journalism career with the Buffalo News and the New Haven Register. He graduated from Missouri School of Journalism in 1976, and he earned his master's degree from the Yale Divinity School in 1985. Between 2000 and 2002, David served as president of the Religion News Writers Association, RNA. He had been recognized repeatedly among America's top 10 secular religion news writers. He is an award-winning journalist. His collection includes the RNA's James O. Suppler Memorial Award for Religion Writer of the Year and the Wilbur Award for Excellence in Secular Religion Journalism. He received several other honors for investigative reporting on various topics, including scandals in churches. After leaving the Associated Press, he worked for the Cleveland Plain Dealer, and his writings were distributed by the RNS, RNS, and he wrote and edited for the United Methodist News Service. One of his longtime passions is to take religionism, religion journalism globally. Yet he always makes the point that it's not the case of American journalists telling others how to report on religion, but more a case of international journalists sharing experiences and learning from one another. The IRJ is set up precisely for this purpose. Let me recite a couple of paragraphs from his article about the founding of the IRJ. In his 2012 article, uh, he is commenting on the rise of religious radicalism how this affects the works of journalists and how issues relating to faith can cross borders with starting speed and consequences. So let me quote. Now is the time for the type of knowledgeable on the ground reporting that provides careful international perspective regarding the complex motifs behind many events and places and places in context the actions of small groups of radicals amid the public and private lives of people of faith throughout the world. Yet too often limited by our own cultural biases and limitations, this broader understanding gets lost at home and abroad amid advocacy journalism and fact reporting that reinforce popular misconceptions of fears of religious minorities and religion in public life. End quote. Let me just add as a final point, a personal note about David. I have not come across a journalist who is as humble as David. He has been writing extensively about humility, about how humility is a value held in high esteem in all major faiths, and how many religious leaders, clergy struggle in the humility religion paradox how humility is important for a long lasting relationship. These are beautifully written articles and even more beautiful because I know the person who writes it, David, uh, you are an embodiment of humility. I called David last week to break the news about the award. We had wanted to keep it a surprise but decided to give it as a Christmas gift. And as expected, David was reluctant to accept it. He felt there are others more deserving the award. Well, we beg to differ. Your friends in IARJ and many in journalism profession will be happy if you accept this award. You truly deserve this Lifetime Achievement Award. And I'm sure I'm speaking for many, other, many others present here today that we have been lucky to have you as a friend, a colleague, and a mentor. Journalism and journalists Profit greatly from your immense contribution and wisdom. Thank you, David, and congratulations. Thank you, Andy. Really appreciate that. Beautiful. <laughs> Next speaker is Roger Finke. Um, he's with the Association of Religion Data Archives. 
Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for, for inviting me. David speaks with such affection about all of you that it's really good to be here, and I'm glad you let me be a part of your group here. Um, I, think, I think you were very wise in selecting David for this award for many reasons. I mean, the obvious one, of course, is he has this beautiful, clear, engaging prose. He tells stories that are really have a purpose and are worth telling. And, and perhaps most important for me as a social scientist is he actually reads the things he's writing about. So he really does investigation into what he's writing about. He, he reports on it re remarkably accurate and understands the research remarkably accurate. So I, I have great praise for him in all those areas. And the second reason I think it's really wise to, to select him is um, he's always been such a supporter of, of you, of all of you. Uh, per, he, he personally, I personally witnessed his empathy and concern for international journalists long before IRA or Joe was ever formed. Uh, he expressed concern for other journalists and how they could better be facilitated and helped. And even when he first came in with the International Association of Religion, or with uh, the, I forgot what my organization is called, the Association of Religion Data Archives, one of his concerns was to provide better data, better evidence as far as for international journalists. So. He's always had that deep concern and he's done it in a way which as Andy was mentioning in a very selfless and a sacrificial way. Uh, selfless in the sense that he was always trying to build others up but sacrificial in the sense of, I'm guessing you probably didn't pay him a large amount of money to do all this either. So he really did this out of the, the goodness of his heart. And he's really been committed from day one, I think Andy expressed this as well, to making this an international association. I belong to too many international associations that are founded either in you know, the Europe or the US and then have a few token other international members. He was strongly committed to really supporting international journalism. And I'm very impressed. The third reason that I think you should do this are, are mostly personal ones. Um, I personally am deeply indebted to, to David for many reasons. Uh, the most obvious is, is all that he's done for the, the ARDA, which I work with and founded. Uh, you know, when David started working with the ARDA, he gave us instant credibility, uh, but the most lasting impact he had was just ongoing high quality journalism. Uh, he delivered a content that we couldn't have delivered without him. When he went on to do Global Plus, it was something no one else had dared try. And we found out later uh, that when people did dare try, it took them several million dollars more to succeed at it. So he's really been very successful at this. I will say my greatest debt to David so far though is really personal. Um, he's always been a source of encouragement for me as far as with the ARDA. Uh, even when I tried to discourage him that starting a new foundation association was too much work, he moved forward and still gave me encouragement with what I was doing. And I guess beyond that, as far as beyond just the professional relationship, he's just a good person to be around. Uh, he's good for keeping, helping, focus, helping me to focus on what was important and keeping a good balance in my life. Uh, as he tried to keep a good balance in his own life as well, too. So I miss, we used to have at least monthly phone calls where just he and I would talk. I, I miss that. So I guess we need to start having Zoom beers or something because uh, <laughs> uh, some way to continue expressing this. So anyway, congratulate IRJ. And I'm sure, I'm confident David has touched many lives, but I can say with certainty that he's clearly touched mine. So a great choice. Thank you, Roger. Fantastic. Next speaker is uh, Susan Hogan, who's with the, an editor with the Washington Post, and I think goes back with Dave to I, uh, RNA days. <laughs> Go ahead, Susan. I, um, I changed jobs this year, so I'm okay. now with the Atlanta paper. Um, and I want to thank you for inviting me to say a few words about David. I have to echo Indy in saying, in noting David's humility and how, how self-facing he is. You try to give him a compliment and he will quickly deflect and turn the conversation on you. So David, I think the ceremony is wonderful because we can say wonderful things about you and you can't change the subject. <laughs> I've known David for nearly 30 years and as a young religion writer, he was my role model in journalism as I saw him break story after story of national and international importance. He's won many, many awards over the years and they are a measure of his excellence. His range of, um, of reporting is incredible. He's an outstanding investigative journalist but he's also a masterful storyteller who writes with compassion and empathy. 
as I got to know David, I discovered as others have noted that he is a kind, thoughtful, caring, honest, and ethical person. I also learned that we shared a desire to broaden the conversation among religion writers into one that was truly international. He pursued that vision relentlessly um, despite many, many obstacles that were put in his path. And because he and others in this organization never gave up, I, I, IARJ is, and is making a difference, is making an impact and continuing to thrive. Congratulations, David, on receiving this award. Thank you for being a friend, a mentor, a role model. Your legacy is enormous. Thank you, Susan. As people are speaking, I'm realizing how great an idea this was to have this uh, award ceremony for David and Eric, just to, as people say, just force David to listen. <laughs> the, next, the next speaker is um, Maria Paz Lopez. And I forgot to say in my little mention of her that she was the original uh, chair of the IARJ. Go ahead, Maria Paz. Hello. Hello, dear friends from all over the world. Um, the main reason why I'm speaking here today is because uh, David Briggs, as founding executive director of the IRJ, and me as founding chair uh, at that time, did share long hours of conversation and strategy and tremendous workload and challenges and suffering <laughs> in the early years of the association, mainly between March 2012 and February 2016. Uh, then it was when uh, Doc Todd uh, took the role of, uh, of chair um, uh, after me. So um, <laughs> now I find myself here and it's such an honor to, to be ready to sing his praises. And as a journalist, I will try to do it with accuracy, fairness, <laughs> and balance. So it was his vision, David's vision, of the need of an international association of journalists who cover religion that mobilized the effort, also the initial funding, the initial funding effort to get started as a group with the now legendary mythical founding moment in Villaggio, Italy in early 2012. <laughs> David Briggs, an outstanding American religion journalist with a long professional career that was unknown to me by that time, felt that the new collegial body should be made of committed professionals, certainly, but perhaps even more important than that, that it should be diverse. Because the world is so, diverse, and in order to reflect its religious and cultural complexities, you need a diverse body of journalists. Women and men, young and veteran, staff reporters and freelancers, writers from various countries and continents from all ethnicities and religious backgrounds, a diverse group in which the English language should be a tool of communication not a tool of imposing a Western worldview. So I am a Spanish journalist. Now I am posted in Berlin as foreign correspondent of La Vanguardia and still a religion journalist, um, a religion columnist actually. But for me, back in 2012, when I was a full-time religion writer based in Barcelona, I when I met David on the phone after having Googled and found out about the plan of creating this International Association of Religion Journalists. Oh God, that was that conversation was a defining moment. His assurance to me that this project would be truly international, absolutely made of people with different backgrounds and sensibilities. Well, that that really captured me, and I still remember. So, as you can see, our professional destinies. David and mine were bound to meet at some point, even if eight years ago, we didn't know. And it's been a long way since. And the only thing I can say now is David, thank you for including me in that bunch of reporters that you gathered in Bellagio in 2012. 
because it, it was illuminating for uh, our careers and, uh, and, 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 and for the this, this, this defining moment of starting the association. And thank you also for the illuminating insights that you have insufflated to the association from the very beginning and for the substantial contributions that you keep bringing uh, to it as a special advisor. On a more personal level, we will be friends and professional pals forever. Glorious greetings from your friend and colleague. <laughs> thank you, David. Thank you, Mary Pass. Beautiful, fantastic. Um, yeah. Now we're going to hear a little from David himself. Well, thank you, Doug, and, and, and th thank you to everyone. Um, it's, um, you know, it was a shock uh, last week when Andy called. It, he'd actually sent a note that uh, he and Doug and I would have an urgent meeting uh, because I. <laughs> He was involved in the uh, in the planning for Eric honoring Eric, and uh, used, sometimes an urgent meeting means there's, a, there's an urgent problem. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I, I am overwhelmed with gratitude um, just to know each one of you and to. Uh, it's just been, uh, it's been a lifetime. <laughs> Gratitude. <laughs> when we uh, yeah. begin by saying, uh, you know, Doug kind of introduced the idea in my brain uh, 20, 25 years ago. When he said to me, you, you know, the this organization, the RNA, uh, Dave, Dave, do you mind if I interrupt? Mind if I interrupt? I, there's that people can hear that sound, I assume, right? Yes. Um, Terrible sound. I think it might be coming from Prince Charles' uh, connection. Mm. There was that problem earlier. Right. There we go. Prince Charles, can you hear us? Great. I, okay. Yeah, the sound's gone. Um, why don't you just start again, Dave? Oh, well, uh, it's just uh, well, it, it's just an overwhelming feeling of gratitude uh, and, a, and a real surprise uh, to be honored in this way. Um, and I just might briefly begin by saying uh, uh, some of the people on this call, uh, Doug and Peggy and Susan, and uh, uh, who's also uh, Peter Smith and uh, who's not, and um, and Sandy Dolby uh, uh, were, were part of the first group that, uh, uh, well, when I was president of the RNA, we talked about uh, reaching out uh, internationally uh, in a mutual, uh, <clears throat> in, a, in, a, in a form of mutual respect and dignity. Um, that didn't go over too well, uh, but, uh, you know, these people, uh, so many people have been so involved for so long in this idea. And I did want to just briefly mention that Doug kind of really first introduced the idea into my mind when he said, uh, yeah, maybe 20, 25 years ago, said, you know, the RNA is, uh, is really a U.S. organization. And uh, it, I never forgot that. And it, it, it got me thinking. Um, and well, I, I, I just feel that every moment on this journey has been a blessing um, to, uh, <coughs> to meet uh, uh, so, well, so many different people and particularly, uh, well, and, and especially, uh, uh, well, uh, and with gratitude for the people on this call. And, um, but every moment uh, from the very beginning um, has been a gift. And we, we started out, uh, as Susan might know, uh, as well, the, the International uh, Association for Religion Journalists uh, uh, had asked me to uh, lead a couple of uh, dialogues um, uh, on, uh, well, they said teaching. Uh, uh, 
American American organizations always look look at it as training others rather than learning from others. But we we changed those in the dialogues, and I, I got to meet uh, uh, include many of the people on this call, including um, and just learned uh, you know that how this could uh, how this organization could work. We, you know, we'd start out with uh, people from uh, all over the world with many different. Uh, understandings and we'd end up just journalists uh, recognizing the, the problems we all faced and the challenges and the joys we faced together and it uh, it was a precursor to uh, to this and then we uh, and then I, I, I think I've shared with other people but I, I should share it with you briefly is that uh, uh, it was just kind of walking on the, after we'd done a couple of these, it was just kind of walking on the street one day that said, uh, we should, let's go for this. And I, I approached, um, I mentioned the idea of the IRJ, could we, um, uh, could we ask for a grant uh, for this to get started? And, uh, and they asked me, well, go ahead and, you know, draw up a, uh, a proposal uh, that they submitted, and it was accepted. Um, and they, you know, I was asked to be the the project director. Uh, of course, it was part of a big organization, um, but everything worked out, and it, uh, it was just there's so much love and kindness and and wonder at uh, the opportunity I had to travel around the world and and, and meet uh, different people. And so I, uh, I just feel I've been, uh, it's just been so important uh, to me that you've all been, a, each of you have been a gift to me. And, uh, and the day will come soon when Odingo and I, <laughs> Odingo and I meet. Uh, but uh, I, I just, uh, I just learned so much. And uh, I think what we do is so, so important uh, because we're still, even 10 years later, we're still one of the, uh, the only organization uh, that I know of uh, is truly international. All these other organizations with international in their name or international in their, uh, I'm just not aware of that many that actually uh, uh, are international in practice. That uh, in the very beginning, we had, uh, I guess, eight board members and that grew a bit, but, uh, until Peggy, uh, a marvelous choice for our first uh, uh, member from uh, North uh, U.S. Uh, <clears throat> all our board members were uh, uh, members from throughout the, every part of the world, and uh, we have uh, in, in in meeting with journalists that was so critical. I particularly remember a, a time in uh, Israel uh, where Jonah kindly introduced. Uh, a half a dozen of his colleagues uh, that wrote on religion, and we all sat in a coffee shop. And Joan, if I'm not mistaken, every one of them said, "Well, this isn't going to be a U.S. organization, is it?" Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I promised them to my, um, I promised everyone uh, throughout the world that uh, that no, this is this is going to be a professional organization where mutual and respect and dignity and, and, and sharing and learning from one another, as long as I uh, am involved at all, would be, be right at the center. And I think what we have done together uh, is so important. Uh, we're, uh, it, it's critical to the world to show a way of, uh, that, that you, every one of you are doing. And, uh, you know, Andy mentioned that, and, and I, I have gotten a particular interest in humility, you know, the idea uh, of the value of humility and science has uh, promoted that, the idea that uh, we'd be open to new ways of understanding, that uh, we, we respect one another, that uh, we recognize each other's strengths uh, and, and be sensitive to our own weaknesses. Uh, but I, I wonder if it's a little bit uh, uh, more than that. I, uh, 
I think it's a matter of love, um, you know, that we, lo we love one another when we treat each other as human beings, that we don't group uh, entire groups into, uh, into boxes, uh, often based on our own prejudices. But this group, uh, you know, seeing Uday and uh, uh, from India and uh, Wakar from Pakistan, uh, just as, as one example, as great professional journalists and colleagues who come from, uh, you know, different religious uh, backgrounds and national backgrounds who promote the understanding uh, among uh, uh, Muslims and Hindus and, uh, well, Muslims, <laughs> excuse me, uh, yeah, Muslims and Hindus in, uh, in, both, uh, in both countries. And, well, I think what we're doing is, is really uh, important. And uh, from that very beginning, um, uh, uh, what, what I was gonna share is that, uh, was that moment walking down the street that I felt in my own life, I felt like it was the Holy Spirit speaking to, uh, to me, uh, that this is something that would bring value to the world. And just like in, all sorts of people with all sorts of different belief systems um, uh, can, could have created this organization, but uh, but I think at the end it's uh, it, it it comes down. And Uday could speak much more eloquently than I can about this, but it comes down to uh, love for one another. The you know the passage both in it's central to both Judaism and uh, Christianity. And well, I, I believe in, in all the world religions that uh, uh, for many people to love God with all their heart and mind and soul and, and to love one another as yourself, particularly the shared vision of loving one another as yourself. I believe that, that we show that to the world and we can offer a way out of polarization. And I'm just so grateful uh, to, uh, you're all gifts to me and I, uh, it doesn't, uh, I wish, uh, I, I, I wish, uh, I <clears throat> could be better at, at, at loving each one of you. Uh, but I think at the end, uh, I think love is important as well as, uh, 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 you know, as well as the other gifts that journalists have in, in not uh, trying to convince others that, uh, that their point of view or their reporting is right, but just trying to experience the wonder of the world in all its diversity and, and report that uh, accurately. So I, I guess my, my only, um, uh, just like to end by just uh, giving immense amount of gratitude to uh, well, to every one of you, and, and Andy, you were so particularly kind, and I, Doug, I, I hate to mention any individuals, Larby and Lisa, and, but Maria Paz, and, uh, and Jonah, and, um, and I'm leaving people out and getting to meet Jelena and uh, Odinga and Eric, and, uh, and please forgive me if I've left anybody out of this call, uh, but, uh, I, you have made a tremendous difference in my life, and as as I'm, uh, as, as I've tried to minimize myself from that very first day when I had the, uh, you have uh, you have done remarkable work, and I hope to continue to be a volunteer in, in supporting um, uh, each one of you. But it is you that the the future is in in your hands, and. Uh, well, I just, just wish love and peace and joy to all of you. And, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thanks for, I, there's so much I could say, but I'm cheering up a bit, actually. Thanks for your vision and bringing us together. And let's keep this thing going. Let's have a, I think we could clap for Dave. <laughs> Great. Now, thank you. We're going to hear a few more words from David now, actually, as he introduces Eric's, Eric and his career and the amazing things he's done. So Dave, 
take it away again. Well, uh, thank you. This is what I was supposed to be doing today. Uh, <laughs> and this is the, the real pleasure, uh, uh, pleasurable part of the, uh, uh, of the day for, for me. Um, you know, we, when we first met, well, many of us first met uh, Eric in uh, Bellagio um, in 2012, uh, what struck me was, uh, you know, we, we had a really busy uh, uh, time, uh, as Larby and Elisa can remember, and, uh, and all of us. But Eric was such a dedicated journalist when the rest of us, you know, maybe at the end of the night, uh, went out for uh, a beer or just went out for coffee. And uh, Eric was still working. And in the morning before we started our long day, Eric was working uh, again. I said, here is an incredibly dedicated journalist. Uh, uh, and... <clears throat> And it, and I wasn't to know uh, his full story, um, but it's it's a remarkable story. Um, Eric uh, is an investigative journalist uh, uh, based in, in Dar es Salaam, who writes for a remarkable array of international and uh, regional publications. Uh, and, uh, and mainly covering issues in, in Tanzania and uh, the surrounding region. Uh, he regularly has contributed to the East African, the Africa Report, the Economist Intelligence Unit, Africa Confidential, The Guardian, The Times of London, and the Global Development News Agency Interpress Service. And what, we, what I was to learn uh, uh, what we were, what we're all to learn is, uh, and, and we have learned from our colleagues, including Prince Charles around the world, just how courageous and inspiring the work of, of journalists in, in, well, many parts of the world, uh, including Nigeria and Tanzania, uh, just to do the work. Um, Eric, uh, has just been a, well, he has been a mentor to, uh, to Tanzanian journalists through the Tanzanian Media Fund, but he's been a, a mentor to all of us uh, in his work in extraordinarily challenging circumstances, just holding the highest ethical standards of reporting in some of the most, uh, in one of the most challenging environments uh, to be a journalist in the world. Um, you know, there was a period, uh, and Eric can correct me on any of this, uh, but there was a period in uh, Tanzania where the relative uh, liberalization of politics uh, toward the media, but <clears throat> over, uh, but that's, that's changed uh, dramatically. And, uh, and, <clears throat> you know, uh, and again, forgive the pronunciations, but uh, with uh, the election of President uh, uh, Magufuli and uh, and the ruling Chamasha Mapinduzi party, which has maintained an outright majority in Tanzanian politics since elections were first introduced in 1992 and winning every five years uh, election since 1995, there has been uh, uh, well, a terrible, almost brutal uh, progression in, uh, in dealing with uh, the opposition, and that includes the media. Uh, shutting, <clears throat> shutting down newspapers, critical of the administration, barring rallies, arresting opposition leaders, and finding other media outlets. And throughout all of that, uh, you know, Eric, uh, and his writing uh, and his uh, reflections has been um, a model of journalistic courage in, in, in writing about these issues fairly and accurately. Uh, even as around him, uh, journalists were being, uh, well, in some cases murdered or hung or uh, beaten severely. 
and his own case, he's, uh, his parents were um, uh, <coughs> taken and uh, detained and warned uh, to warn Eric about uh, 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 you know, his writing and, and what the consequences could be. And, and many of you know that uh, he was arrested last year and nine days before his arrest, uh, he co-authored a story about tension within Tanzania's ruling party and the alleged plot to prevent the president um, from running for a second term. Nine days later, uh, uh, a group of men uh, came in and, um, uh, well, uh, a group of men uh, not officially identified came in and took him from his house. And uh, for 24 hours, he was detained without any charges. And, uh, <coughs> and, uh, <coughs> and that led to uh, uh, a nightmare over the last seven months of detention and, uh, and, uh, and beating and, uh, on, on, on charges that were, you know, uh, had no merit. Uh, it was just meant in, as an intimidation tactic. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, <coughs> I, uh, well, unfortunately, uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, excuse me for one second while I just get my notes correct. Uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, the official charges against Eric uh, changed throughout his imprisonment. First, they were over Eric was a Tanz Tanzanian citizen and allegations of seditious cyber crimes before landing on claims to use two private companies to commit uh, tax evasion. Uh, uh, Eric's attorneys and he decided to uh, plead guilty to the tax evasion charge and had to pay fine up to $100,000 in the US just to get him out because of his declining health over his treatment in, uh, in prison. But even then, as soon as he was released, he, uh, he credited fellow journalists with helping to get through what he described as a trying time for all the, his fellow journalists that stood with him in prayers and in comfort. Many of you came to greet me at, at Sagaria Prison. You brought me books and newspapers and you encouraged me to stand firm in the situation I was facing. Well, he's encouraged the world, uh, the journalists all over the world to stand firm in, in the face of uh, injustice. And he is, uh, even uh, two months or, or just shortly before his release, his mother, uh, who is uh, his, his teacher and uh, mentor, uh, <coughs> you know, passed away before she could again uh, hug, uh, hug her son. And Eric, uh, we, we cannot uh, tell you uh, what a gift you are to all of us. Uh, and we cannot know, uh, we just have an idea of, uh, of the suffering you have undergone in the past, uh, well, almost two years now. Uh, uh, as the trauma uh, of the the trauma of your uh, uh, your treatment continues, and you you have not been allowed out of the country uh, to get treatment uh, for uh, for the beatings you received. Um, so we are so uh, honored. Uh, to, pre uh, to present uh, to uh, present you with this uh, to to that you have agreed to join us in the in the Hall of Fame. Um, so uh, you're a blessing to all of us, uh, and there's so much more. But uh, I uh, 
I'm, uh, well, uh, I don't know uh, how much more to say. It's just, um, it's just a gift to be back together with you again. And you are just the epitome of what we, of, of, of who we would like to honor in the Hall of Fame. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thanks for saying it's um, an honor to be in Eric's presence here. We're going to hear some testimony from Tausta Masokwa. She's with the Tanzania Media Foundation. Thanks so much for making yourself available. Tausta, go thank ahead. You. Yeah. Thank you, Douglas. Um, and thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's, uh, it's really inspiring to me to learn about uh, the International Association of Religious Journalists or Religion Journalists and what it is you're doing. And um, it's also really uh, apt, I think, that uh, I get to hear that Eric is also um, part of what it is you're doing. Um, so I'm just going to give uh, my own personal experience um, and interaction with Eric. Uh, in the faith tradition that I belong to, when one is asked to give a testimony, um, is to speak in public about one's personal uh, story of faith, or um, in other words, the process of uh, building your relationship with that which you have faith in. Um, so this is my personal story of a process in which um, Eric has played a key part for me, whether he knows it or not. Um, and this is kind of my own journey with journalism and working in the journalism sector and um, in the Tanzanian context. Um, Eric has been a big part of that. Um, whether he knows it or not, Eric often features in my stories of what it takes to be a great journalist. Um, and I mean uh, both the glory and the pain. Um, but I will only talk today about um, the main lessons that I've learned from Eric, whom I met soon after I started my own career in, in, in journalism, um, short-lived as it was um, in practical journalism. I met Eric, um, I think it was around 2004 um, when I joined Monanchi Communications Limited. Um, I won't say just yet what lessons I learned from Eric. Uh, and I hope you forgive me also in talking, that in talking about Eric, uh, I will also be talking about myself, but this is uh, my personal testimony of Eric, and it's about how I have related with him since we met. Um, Eric and I met late in 2004, I think, uh, or 2005, early 2005, around the time when I started uh, my first job, which was a job in journalism. And at the time, Eric was still a student. Um, and uh, I think we were both quite lucky in that we uh, had the opportunity to work with uh, one of the leading um, media houses and centers for quality journalism in Tanzania. And I think it's had a profound impact on both of us. Uh, back then, I think Eric was just like me uh, in the sense that we both had no real idea uh, what journalism was all about and what it would take to be um, successful journalists and um, I think we couldn't have known then how much being a good journalist has to do with hard work. Uh, personally, I thought then that uh, it was just a talent or a gift, um, something that someone just had and they worked at it very easily and effortlessly, um, just the way one would work a beautiful smile or, or something that you know someone was just born with. But I think one of the main lessons that I've learned uh, working with Eric and seeing him work um, is that um, this is not so, you know, journalism is not just about talent or gifts. Um, and this is why I personally will always admire um, Eric. Um, I learned from Eric that it takes, um, it takes a certain amount of heartfelt desire to be a good journalist. It has to come from your heart uh, but it doesn't just take desire, it also takes hard work. Um, and I learned this um, over the course of the several years that I've um, watched Eric, worked with Eric, um, and seen what Eric has had to endure. 
Um, I did learn this very quickly. It's not something that I think uh, when you're just starting out, you pick up um, just like that. Um, and at the time when, uh, when we met, uh, we were both just starting out in our careers. And I think we were both just caught up in what work demands of you when you're young and what you yourself uh, um, set as goals uh, for yourself personally. Um, I should point out that um, back then, um, 2004, 2005, um, I think I was always more of a writer than I was a journalist. Um, and so uh, when we worked together, I very quickly became more involved in sub editing, um, which for me was work that involved storytelling as opposed to chasing stories. And um, Eric for me was uh, one of those who was involved in chasing stories. Um, and then I think we would work together to craft these stories into something that uh, um, people could consume. Um, I say Eric taught me hard work because I wonder if today he remembers that uh, back in the day when we worked together, he always submitted much more copy than he was required. And um, I think it was because Eric is just hardworking. Um, something David said uh, um, rang true to that. But for me, it was like he was giving me a lot more work than I <laughs> required at the time because my job was to make sure that I cut the story down and it fit into the space that, uh, um, that it needed to fit in. Uh, but um, I think this is one of the things uh, that makes Eric Eric. Um, in my view, he's always done more than, than he has had to. And he's always, uh, um, I think, kind of opted or allowed himself to endure more than, than he has had to. Um, but I guess there's more to the lesson uh, I learned from Eric than, than just hard work in the sense that the hard work that I had to do because of all the work that uh, Eric brought in um, probably twice as much as all the other journalists on our team back in the day. Uh, but while I left the newsroom um, just two years, I think, after um, I started uh, to join civil society and to work uh, in the broader area of information access, Eric stayed in journalism. And um, for me, um, him staying in journalism um, allowed him to do all that he's done um, in the years since then, in the years since we met in 2004, um, some of which um, um, has been shared here already. Um, so I won't talk much, much about that. Uh, but it also allowed, I think, uh, what happened in the sense that there was a bit of a switch um, in the sense that when I met Eric, he was a student and I was uh, a working uh, journalist. Uh, but I think over the years, I've learned a lot more um, from him than, uh, than he has learned from me. Um, we have uh, worked together um, after our stint in journalism in the same newsroom uh, when Eric joined uh, in 2010, a fellowship at the then Tanzania Media Fund, um, the first fellowship uh, for journalists. And um, on that fellowship, I was a mentor, but I always say that uh, my experience on that fellowship, because of the journalists that were on that fellowship, including Eric, was I felt that I got to learn a lot more about what journalism is all about than um, I probably taught um, any one of them. And um, listening and interacting with Eric uh, in those sessions, uh, 2010, and over the years since then, um, our relationship has always been professional and personal. Um, and I always uh, come out with something that I always tell um, anyone who cares to listen um, to me about, uh, um, you know, what it takes to, to, to just be successful, not just in journalism, but I think in life. Uh, we become who we want to be um, in the sense that we pursue that which uh, matters to us uh, and we choose, uh, in a way, um, under different circumstances, of course, what we can and what we cannot endure to become that which we want to be. Um, and I think um, Eric has had to endure a lot 
um, um, David has, has hinted at some of those experiences. I won't get into those. Um, There's so many, and I, I think that this is a time more to celebrate um, what Eric has done. Um, it's up to us to grow uh, in the areas that we choose to, um, to work in. And for me, what I've learned from Eric is that he was determined to grow um, in circumstances that were tough, in circumstances that were um, uh, challenging, uh, personally beyond what I could imagine experiencing, you know, I've I've, I've witnessed him experiencing all of that, and um, sometimes from near, sometimes from far, uh, I've gotten to watch him grow, and I hope that in watching him grow, you know, I have also grown. Um, and uh, not just me, um, I also believe that many of the other journalists that have worked with, with Eric, um, many of the ones that I encounter in my work now um, are inspired by, by him. Um, and five minutes is not enough um, to get into all of the things that I would love to say about Eric. You know, I would love to talk about his courage, his resilience, his integrity, his passion. Um, all the lessons that I've learned from him, um, from his professional and his personal life. Um, I can only say um, that for those who have worked with Eric um, and those who have seen him from the time he started out um, to where he is now, including myself, um, that we are so proud of what you've become, Eric. Um, and for me, you are one of the most deserving journalists from Tanzania. Uh, you are uh, fully deserving of this award. Uh, you're fully deserving of being honored uh, for all the work that you've done. And it's so diverse um, that I can't even get into it when I think of the stories that uh, um, you started out doing uh, when we were at the Citizen to the stories that I've seen you do um, at an international level and the complex issues that I've seen you um, grapple with uh, and do justice to. Uh, um, sticking to the principles of fairness and balance in, in your reporting. Um, well done. Um, I'm proud to be your friend. And um, I am very privileged um, to have had the honor of learning from you, Asante Sana, Asante Sana Eric, and uh, well done. Thank you. Thank you, Fausta. I really appreciated that. And it's, it's great to have other colleagues of Eric's here from Africa and the rest of us around the world for this. The next uh, testimony is by Absalom Kabanda, who I see is here. He's the former chair of the Tanzania Editors Association and head of the um, communications at New Habari Media Group. Go ahead, Absalom, great to see you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I don't think I, it's the night here. Yeah. I, had to, I, I, I had to park somewhere uh, alongside the traffic so that I could, I could be attending this video meeting, especially for a, for a friend, uh, a colleague, a young brother, a family member, Eric Cabendera, whom I've known for the, for the past 16 years now. Actually, a lot have been said by David and later by Fausta. Uh, as a colleague, uh, I've been, I knew Eric in 2004, 16 years back, when we worked together at Monanchi Communications Limited. I was the editor then, and he was just a new reporter working for The Citizen. But interestingly, I was six years older in the field than he was. <laughs> but, <laughs> and I'm 10 years older than he is. But uh, funny enough, uh, uh, apart from the two that I was the editor and I was a reporter, within a year or so, he became the well-known uh, reporter within the cycles of the citizen. That's why an international media or international publications uh, in Britain and elsewhere, like the, the Independent, The Guardian, and Times, The Economist, uh, and others came to know about Eric as how David had said, and he was picked then to become a distinguished reporter. And you could find that as an investigative reporter, Eric has written much on politics, not only of Tanzania, but of region of East Africa, 
and Africa at large. And actually, this is not the first award to be won by Eric. I know he's won some other award before because he was worked for the World Bank. He's written globally. He was written in some stories of all in West Africa, in Central Africa, in Congo, because he's written a lot, not only in politics, but also on, on his extractive industries. So Eric is a person, is a journalist who could not leave a stone unturned when he's pursuing a story. Uh, I've known him not only as a, co as a colleague, but also as a human, as a, a journalist with, with a heart. Because sometimes in 2013, I was attacked uh, here in Dar es Salaam. And Eric, without going back to home, when the, when the doctors recommended that I, would to, I to be airlifted to South Africa, boarded a plane with me as a friend, a colleague, and a nurse to South Africa in a plane for five, five hours. And he, he stood by me, making sure that I got treated because I was also injured when, when I was working as a journalist. That's why when he was, he was arrested last, uh, this, it was, it was in, in uh, last year, July, and forced to stay in custody for seven, for, for seven months, uh, his friends, colleagues, and the international community came up uh, against the, the incident, fighting for him, knowing, for, knowing exactly the role he has played in journalism, and the UK, Britain, and the a number, Amnesty International, and the number of uh, international organizations stood by him until when the government decided to free him seven, seven months after being in custody on pre bargaining category, knowingly, as how David said, uh, the, the charges were baseless, only if, only knowing that Eric has, has always been holding authorities and individuals accountable for their mistakes and their role in poor governance in the country and elsewhere. That's how I can say less because of what, uh, or, or what whatever I could say more is what has been said or shared by Fausta and David on Eric. Thank you, Absalom. Fantastic. And thanks for coming to us from your car. <laughs> thank, uh, thank you so much. In the evening in Africa, it's amazing. Um, we, we said we'd go for to about now, but, um, and somebody said they have to leave at half, hour, half past the hour. So we'll keep moving along here. This is fantastic. Uh, now we'll hear some testimony by Prince Charles Dixon, who's on the IARJ board. Um, and he's a journalist in Nigeria. Go ahead, Prince Charles. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. <laughs> All right, um, I'm not, not going to say, say just very few. I think I want to speak with uh, of Eric uh, from just two perspectives. Uh, one would be the fact that um, Eric, as a journalist, has met my criteria as a superb colleague. Uh, I've read a couple of works and they show me curiosity, loyalty, they show me kindness, they show me a passionate, tenacious uh, ability in the work that he does. Uh, I remember just in July when we had a conversation around the fact that he had been picked up. I could relate with that because uh, working in Nigeria, I know what it is like when journalists are picked up. Uh, your phone's taken away, your family's harassed. In his case, his wife's phone was picked away. And for a couple of days, we, we couldn't even wrap our heads around what it was that he had done wrong. And it was tough, tough a period having to coordinate, find out what uh, uh, the Committee for Protection of Journalists had on their own end and what we had. Uh, working with Elisa and uh, Dog to be able to put out something on our sites to at least get a little bit of uh, information across the global uh, journalism world to say, look, one of us is going through this. Uh, it's not every time you find a journalist come out and skated with such experience. I remember speaking with a colleague in Tanzania who said it will be a matter of days. Okay, I think we lost Prince Charles. Oh, too bad. Um, 
Let's just wait a couple of seconds to see if he can come back. Um, I can't express enough admiration from Canada for um, the kind of difficult conditions a lot of other journalists work through in, and especially Eric in this case. Um, here, hi, Prince Charles. Yeah. Did I, I lost you for a second. Yeah, we lost you for about 20 seconds, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I can only say that the choice of IRJ uh, in picking Eric and also uh, having to bestow this honor upon him is one that is unquestionably one of the best decisions we've taken. It also would act as motivation for those who walk across the globe. Uh, most of us are proud to be members of IRJ, a truly international global organization. And Eric, we just cannot but say thank you for the work you do. Thank you importantly for the people who learn from the work you do. And thank you for the encouragement and the motivation you bring for those who practice and those who write and those who investigate. Uh, in the work you've done over the years, you've proven that a good journalist should not be afraid. A good journalist must be honest by nature. A good journalist must be curious about everything and all things. And in this regard, I want to say a very big congratulations to you. Congratulations, Eric, and congratulations to everyone at AI, uh, IRAJ. Thank you, Prince Charles. It's really great to get your perspective and everybody else's. It's uh, so impressive. Now, now we get to hear a few words from Eric himself. Oh, oh thank you very much uh, for this award. I'm, I'm truly honored to receive it. I'm, I'm overwhelmed by all your support from HRJ, from my colleagues from Tanzania who have stood by me, who have um, basically stood up to be counted in, a, in an environment where everybody basically is afraid to rise up their hands to be seen as supporting a journalist like me. Um, uh, um, thank you very much for um, ARG colleagues for speaking out. Um, I think for a journalist who, who is in my situation or who have faced the same situation like mine, the voice, every voice matters. Your safety is the voice of your colleagues. Um, I would like to also thank the, the, the colleagues who joined us from uh, Tanzania. These were colleagues who were fearless, who um, were not scared to be uh, seen supporting me, uh, who lead some uh, the government's efforts to say I was innocent so in a country uh, that is going through difficult uh, period when it comes to press freedom and, and freedom of expression, having colleagues stand up by you, um, not being scared of being jailed themselves because of being seen supporting you is quite incredible. So thank you very much all for everything you've done to me. And I hope uh, the solidarity, the unity can continue supporting uh, colleagues who are facing similar circumstances like mine. Um, when we had um, the first call with the David, David posed um, an interesting question to me. He said, Eric, how did your faith help you during your incarceration? And this question triggered um, some of the painful and bitter memories that I've had gone through in the past two years. And um, and uh, I remember the first week after I um, I had been, you know, jailed. Um, um, a family member showed up um, uh, to see me uh, in prison with a book that was written by uh, Saint Jude Tadeus. So Saint Jude Tadeus was one of the disciples, Jesus Christ's disciples, and. Um, in, in, in Christianity is being considered as um, uh, a patron of uh, um, uh, difficult cases. So a family member said, um, I believe if you say prayers by St. Jude, um, 
you stay strong and you get released from prison. And the, the simple uh, statement that was made by a family member actually triggered how the, uh, my boyhood, you know, um, being born and raised a Christian, serving as an altar boy, you know, following the rules, uh, staying out of trouble, um, and, and, and then basically be, being jailed, of course, for doing your work. But I just realized that uh, faith was key in keeping me strong, uh, not pointing the fingers at anybody, and believing in what I, I did as a journalist, and believing that no matter how long it would take, uh, the truth will always prevail, and I'm, and I'm going to be freed. Um, um, secondly, I would also like to talk about the, the, the in prison, um, the prison that I was um, 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 uh, held up is, is notoriously known uh, for all sorts of uh, criminals, you know, uh, you know, uh, across the country. And what I got in, uh, inside, regardless of uh, the, the charges uh, each of the inmates were facing, they saw me as a person who represented the hope, a person who um, could speak up for uh, people who had no platform to, to speak out. Um, so uh, it gave me great hope to learn that I actually continue doing my work as a journalist even when we're in prison. So by listening to stories of individuals, the story of stories of people, we're in a prison with about 12,000 inmates. And each morning you have people seated outside your cell thinking that you could be that person to help them uh, become free the following day. And, and one of the stories that I still remember today was a story of uh, um, um, a gay young boy who, was, uh, who had been um, uh, sentenced to serve a month in prison four times for the situation I was uh, um, um, uh, in, in prison. And the fourth time when he came back, um, he had been uh, charged to serve a month and a half for reutering and prostitution. And when it was a Sunday service, uh, where you know inmates, regardless of their faith, would come together uh, to say prayers, he came to me and said, "Am I allowed to come into church and prayers?" I said, "Why not?" Because he said, "Well, all my life." Uh, um, I've been rejected. I couldn't go to church. I couldn't go to mosque because I'm gay, and and I'm I'm worried whether I want to be kicked out, you know. And and when I held his hand and walked inside with him, he broke down into tears, um, and he said for the first time, "I feel accepted." Um, and, and, and I think that was a lesson to me to say as a journalist, you know, where we deal with different kind of stories, um, but at the same time as human being, we are always quick to judge that this is bad, this is wrong. But I think our responsibility is to tell the stories uh, regardless of how bad this is in our highs or regardless of how good it is in our highs. Um, and this is the work that I, 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 I am determined to continue pursuing uh, regardless of where it takes me. And I believe this is the only work I was born to do. And, and despite the circumstances I'm facing, it's been a very, very difficult period for me, facing rejection, isolation, unemployment, but at heart, the journalism the truth telling, the determination, nobody can take that away, no matter how long I would stay in prison. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Wow, yeah. <laughs> your, your strength is uh, amazing <clears throat> and um, 
obviously keep in touch with us about anything we can do to support you and keep you protected. Um, and I appreciate that you're dedicated, but I do, you know, I'm concerned about your keeping safe. And I, I know you'll try and find that balance. And I, I, I think I was, I didn't see Ezekiel's hand go up a while ago. So maybe there's a little chance you could say something now, Ezekiel, with your baby there. <laughs> Uh, thank you for inviting me for this. Uh, I focus on what happened. Ezekiel, it's a bit hard to hear you. I've been a meeting for. Sure. It... Now, can you hear me now? That's better. Go ahead. Better. Okay. So I'm saying uh, uh, thank you and uh, Sister Hannah to meet all of you here. Uh, the only thing I want to say is uh, Eric is a good friend of mine. Uh, can you hear me? No, it's I, we can hear you, but it's all garbled. Oh. Keep, uh, I, I don't know what to say. So um, maybe I should, I should write. I think I should write. <laughs> does, I should does anybody write. have suggestions? <laughs> Maybe maybe you can turn off the camera and just the sound. Yeah, try it. Right Ezekiel. Okay. Turn off the camera. Okay. Uh, I think. Uh, camera, camera, mute. Now say something. Hello. Yeah. Let me try that. <clears throat> Um, it's no, you're getting cut out all the time. Yeah, it's too bad. Try it one more time, Absalom. Just say something. No, it's not working. That's too bad. That's too bad. Um, we we should wrap up now. That's as as anybody maybe want to say something for 20 seconds that they haven't had a chance to say to David or Eric. Um, Pedro, yeah, go ahead. Yes, just uh, tw in 20 seconds, thank you very much, David, for, for, uh, for phoning me as happened with Maria Paz and asking me to be part of York. I would like just to say a couple of words few words that David vision of a, who, who doesn't see the US as the center of the world, I think was the most important thing when he thought about building a IARG. And I think that's, that's very important. His vision that the world is really a world and the US is not the center of the, of the world, just that. Thank you, Pedro. Dinga, did you want to say something? Uh, I was aligning with what Pedro said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember Pedro giving David and all of us a really hard time right at the beginning saying he didn't want this to be a U.S. <laughs> State Department backed organization. It was very good. I also really want to add uh, a very small thing. Hi, hi everyone. Sorry, I'm, I was late actually. I was stuck somewhere. I was really because the diversity which we have developed from in last eight years, and we 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 were the first persons there in, on this forum. Really, it's it's very amazing, and the story that we are doing and the way we are taking the religion journalism cause in the society, that is very much. I mean, somehow when we do stories on religion, we also find confidence to establish this particular religion journalism thing in our newsroom, in our society, in our politics. There are a lot of vibrations when we get that. That is very much amazing. Thanks, David. Thanks, everyone here who is available and very much devoted to this cause. Thank you, Bhavya. That's great to hear from you. Yeah. <laughs> There's Maria Paz wants to say something. Turn on your mute, off your mute. 
Yes, um, sorry, I, I take the, the word again because I, I didn't have the opportunity to say anything about Eric. And just I wanted to say that he's very brave and thank you, Eric, for showing us uh, as the people who, who live in countries where there's no problem with, with being a journalist, there's no real danger and to remember and to understand that it's not the same everywhere. So thanks uh, a lot for your uh, testimony because it helps us to, to move forward and to understand that uh, not everybody is, is privileged. And uh, so uh, as Doug said, please keep a balance. You don't need to be a brave journalist every day. Just mm -hmm. <laughs> protect yourself. It's more important for us than, than, than journalism sometimes. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Maria Paz. Great. Unless somebody wants to desperate to say something, I think we should start wrapping it up. And I want to thank Andy for all the coordinating he's done of this and such a yeah. we, we photos. What's that? We and stay for the photos. photos. Stay for the photos. Can can everyone turn on the camera and put your best wide smile on the camera. <laughs> have to smile. You have to smile. That's right. Big smile. <laughs> Even you, Pedro. <laughs> okay, and Absalom. Absalom, are you there? Uh, let me see. Okay, one, two, three. One more, just one more, just in case. Oops, sorry. Such a tech folk. <laughs> All right, file. Okay, we are done. Back to you, Doug. Well, I'm ready to wrap it up just to thank uh, David for his incredible vision, a well, great career before that, and it still continues, and his vision for getting this going. And to thank Eric again for his strength and to know that we're behind you, even though. <laughs> And we want to keep you protected, as Maria Paz says. Do anything hey. we can for that. And uh, Peggy, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that we have certificates that will uh, be sent to them. And actually, Marty has a copy of them if he wanted to hold them up or anything. Right. Thanks for remembering that. Marty? You're mute, Marty. Yeah. There we go. So, David, here is yours. And Eric, this will be coming your way. Thank you. Well, thank you, folks, for everybody being here. It's, such a, it's been such a treat to be part of this group and to meet everybody around the world and continue mm -hmm during COVID to meet you this way. I'm glad we pushed to make this happen this year. Um, I, I'm gonna sign off and I, I don't know if people wanna hang around and chat with each other, but uh, uh, it, well, it's, it's hard to say goodbye to your smiling faces around the world. <laughs> everybody, Uday. So long. Bye everyone. Bye. So long, bye. Happy New Year to everyone. Thanks. Happy New Year to you, Andy. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um. Well, th thank you again, Andy, for all that you did to make this happen. Oh. <laughs> My Andy, <laughs> this was a special Christmas present. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, for me too. I was able to yeah, see you, Lisa. Great seeing everyone. Mm. Oh, I miss you, Odinga. I miss you all. I miss you, miss you more. <laughs> Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Bye. Marty. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, David, Take Marty, care. everybody. Bye. Careful. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Marnie. Thank you, everybody. Huh.